The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Thank you. Like, and I don't mean write software for a living. I mean, you're not a system administrator who writes software. You write actual software for a living. How many people who do not write software for a living? You're a system administrator? Yeah. OK. So I should probably just go ahead and divide you into these two camps. If I had any sense, I probably would go ahead and do that. But that's OK. Um, the, uh, the primary target for everything I speak is those two groups of people. but. They are, uh, usually I am typically more, um, I've been a software developer since I was about 12. And so this is year 35 for me. And I am typically strangely more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, sympathetic to the operational side of things because I had this kind of epiphany a few years ago where I realized what a giant asshole I had been for about 20 years while I was writing software. So when you, through the course of this, I'm going to probably use a bunch of bad words and probably say some mean things, and they are almost certainly directed at somebody in this room or somebody that you know, and you're perfectly welcome to take those personally or not. Um, it has been a little over five years since I beat anybody up. Actually, five years, five months, five years, five months and 20 days. So take your best shot. I will stand there and you can, you're welcome to stomp the crap out of me. I have become a complete pacifist. So I promise. But if you do get your feelings hurt, um, that's probably for a pretty good reason. Probably I said something that you went, hey, and I do that a lot. I, do, I'm, I say mean things about people an awful lot of the time. I am a consultant. That's what I, they pay me to do that. So um, I, am, uh, I am perfectly willing to hear your stupid side of the story. And if you want to tell me your stupid side of the story, well, I'll listen. I, got, I mean, I'm here all weekend. So um, I, am, I really come to these things because I'm not a open source guy. I am. I do our work in open source all the time, but I'm not really an open source guy. I'm not, I am a Linux guy, but I actually come to these things to meet people to make sure that I don't get lost in the corporate bullshit that I spend my days in all the time. So if somebody has a better example, if you have good data, if you have uh, things where you know that I am patently wrong, that's fine. I'm interested in hearing that. I am not, uh, I am a, a bit of a, an egotist. I do think I'm right about basically everything, but I am also a bit of a scientist. If you prove me wrong, I am totally willing to take your story. So until you have better data than I have, I'm right. But I'm, I'm willing to listen to your data. So without further ado, it is past time. Let's go. See, I might be able to do this by driving it on. I have the Microsoft Blue Mouse. If you don't have this, you're not as cool as me. This mouse turns off by turning it straight up. This is an awesome mouse, um, but it is hard to drive. So uh, I am great and powerful. I am Oz. Uh, actually, I'm not. I'm Michael Alvis. I am a DevOps consultant. That is what I do for a living. And that, uh, that mouse thing is totally not working. Also, it's not anywhere real. Um, I am a DevOps consultant. I am probably not a shape-shifting, mind-controlling lizard man. If you don't know what that means, you should really look up the link to this when, uh, when you see this thing, because that is a really awesome set of nut jobs on the internet. Um, I am, in fact, lawful evil of neutral tendencies. I am a complete control freak. I am willing to let you go and do your thing. If you don't know what lawful evil is, what the hell are you doing in this room anyway? <laughs> um, but, the, uh, but I am, I'm a bit of a control freak. That's how I got into DevOps in the first place. That's actually how I got into everything in the first place. That's how people get into software. We're control freaks. We have this, they have this idea of a thing we want, and we have this magical space we can build it in. And really, there's no law, there are really no laws of physics when you're writing software. 
Um, that's why operational people have such a hard time, purely operational people have a hard time dealing with pure developers, because operational people do live in the real world, and developers kind of don't. I have spent years, decades, being one of those guys is like, yeah, I could do that, Pfft, whatever. What do you mean? What do you mean? Does it, what does that have to run on? I don't care. Somebody will build something that'll run on. Yeah, that's like a really kind of bad way to live your life. Um, this is my Twitter handle. That is my blog. It is infrequently updated. I am not really a Twitter guy. So um, the uh, but the blog actually is. I have like 60 posts that are pending right now because I'm supposed to be feeding these things to some folks in India. So that's actually likely uh, going to be uh, going to pick up the pace a bit. This is you. You're the nitpicker. I'm the armpit scratcher. You're the big picker. I'm actually likely to scratch my armpits across the weekend. If you catch me doing that, I will give you a dollar. If you actually catch me scratching my armpits, because I have, I, have, I have decided that every now and again, I'm like, oh, I'm like, and I decided, nope, no more. If you catch me scratching my armpits over the weekend, I'll give you a buck. Um, you probably work in developer, developer or operational staff. You are, uh, you're probably not underworked. If you're in software, the chances are excellent. If you, get, if you do this for a living, you're probably not underworked. You might be capacity worked. You might do your 40 hours and be OK. But if you actually work in these, in these industries, you probably aren't leaving on time. I leave on time because I am only allowed to bill 40 hours to my client. But then I go back to my hotel room and I work for my company. So it's really not the same thing as leaving on time. Um, chances are excellent you are failing, that you're, well, at least not succeeding. And that's a, really, uh, that's a really painful thing for most people because they really kind of want to do their job where they like to feel they're in control of things. And you are probably not getting the feeling that you're in control of stuff. We have been in software for some, like a little over 60 years now. It has existed as a more or less real concept for a little longer than I've been alive. But for the, tr the truth of the matter is we're not really a whole lot better at producing it now than we were even 30, 40 years ago because we have expanded the scope of what we're working in, and we didn't really turn it into what I would consider a real engineering discipline. Um, I'll talk more about that later. Actually, I'll just bitch more about that later. But the real result of all this is you're probably not happy. You are almost certainly not happy. Software people aren't generally happy people. We are content. We tend to be like, yeah, we did OK. Ah, oh, you know, that delivery went out with only you know, five hours of overtime. Yeah, I only had to stay up until 3 a.m. twice last year. The, uh, ah, no big deal. But we are not, we tend to be content without being happy. It is, it's just not really in your nature if you are constantly looking for making something even just a little bit better all the time. Satisfaction is the best you typically get. Now, I could be projecting myself on there. I'm, I'm, I am a little, uh, I'm a little weird. But I think that I see this enough in other people that I'm not wrong. I work with a whole bunch, I've worked, last year I worked with about 10,000 people overall across the country. I worked with about 10,000 people. Now, I did not work directly with 10,000 people. That would be, like, that's like a rock concert. But I saw all these people and they all had the same expression that you all have right now, which is, uh-huh, uh-huh, whatever, uh-huh, yeah. I mean, they, it's not like they lack emotion. They just don't, they're not, they're, they're, they really aren't, um, they're just not super happy about everything that they're doing. And we, we have, we've gotten in ourselves into this place because we can't really deliver software. Nobody can. If you can find me a place where people really deliver software that does not have Etsy.com as its primary domain, where they're really super friggin' good at it, then I, I'm really interested in seeing that. If you work for this place, you need to tell me where this is, because I at least need to go see it happen. Now, that part of the, 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 the people that I'm talking about are not people who write you know, 600 line shell scripts and upload them to the internet. They're not people who write um, you know, 2,000 line Java uh, libraries that get stuck into the Maven repository. I'm talking about people who write large scale systems, things that really do stuff. Right? That, that deliver real value to somebody, probably where you make some money. I, I really love open source software, but nobody really gets paid fat cash to be an open source guy. Does anybody in here get paid fat cash or even a living wage to be a purely open source developer? Yeah, that's what I thought. I, I, I'm always wondering, it's like, yeah, this is going to be the time where there's like one of those assholes in here. And <laughs> so we're talking about delivering software. 
And we're not talking about pizza, but we're talking about something that works a little bit like pizza. Because Domino's, as I was so rudely told last year, no longer has a 30-minute guarantee for their delivery. But they have something better now. Has anybody delivered, uh, ordered pizza from Domino's online in the last, I don't know, a little while? I, I, I was in the hospital, and it was literally the only thing that would deliver to me in the hospital. But now they have this thing. Remember, do you see, did you see this? It's unbelievable. They have a, a web page that dynamically updates as to where your damn pizza is in the oven. Uh, and who's cooking it? They know who put your crap together. They know who put your, your really shitty pile of carbohydrate and fat into the, into the bowl and shoved it through the oven. And they know the guy who's delivering it to you. Like, <laughs> I mean, if you, if you put that into software, people would call you a god. Not the part where you can see it, but the part where you could say, yeah, it's happening uh, now. That would be amazing. Well, we don't do that. Not ever. But we're talking about doing something that gets stuff into the hands of your consumer, whoever that consumer is. Sometimes your consumer is another piece of software, and sometimes your consumer is a, is a dude, where dude is a, non, a gender non-specific term. But it's somebody who's actually involved in using your stuff. Getting, that, getting your software into the hands of a user is what we're, was the thing I'm talking about when I talk about delivery. Now, the chances are good the problem all started when you did not design correctly. You had, a, you had this is supposed to be engineering, dude. <laughs> it's, but you know, it's a lot more like farming. You know, we, we like, oh yeah, well I got this thing. It's, you know, I, I, well I, I, I got this one little piece of something and I, well, well, and, then I, and then I bolted this other thing on the side of it and it was like, well then, it's like, like, well, you know what? We're just gonna sit out and see, watch it grow. Somebody would come on like, hey, okay, bolt some more stuff on the side, bolt a little more stuff on the side. And it turns into, a, into more like farming than engineering because it's really sort of, um, it's like plant and pray. You know, uh, does anybody, for people who, I, I grew up in a farming company. I, I, grew, I grew up in Alabama. And we had, you know, you planted stuff in the ground, but you just expected about, well, half of it not to come up. That's why, I mean, you just, you plan for that kind of failure. Now, in software, we kind of, the, new, the, new, the hot new thing is kind of planning for failure, too. But it's planning for failure in a different way. This is planning for failure like, it's, that's, this, it's like the most, um, it's the most fatalistic version of writing software. It's like, well, this is never going to work. Anybody ever worked in that place? This is never going to work. They just gave us some new requirements. This is never going to work. Yeah, has anybody said that lately? I said it last week, by the way, just in case nobody, you know, I was, I was that guy. Um, so 50% sucks. 50% success in anything. Just to, I mean, you still fail in college if you have a 50%. Well, unless you got to go to a weird school, I guess. Um, the next part of it is when you, when you have bad design and you don't have a good place to, to hang all your stuff on, then you have probably some bad code. Now, good delivery is, is very dependent, is frequently dependent on good automation. And I mean that at every level. Does anybody, okay, if people are going to write software, do you write unit tests? And the answer can be no, I don't give a shit. But if you write unit tests, do you run those unit tests by hand ever? No, because that's stupid. Why would you do that? That's why you have freaking unit test frameworks in the first place. You have a thing that automates the running of your unit tests. Well, that's like, like this level, right? Or maybe it's like at this level. I'm talking about all the way up. Automation through the course of coding, building your software for the idea of automation is essential to delivery. It is not, oh, like, well, we, if we don't do that, we can still do, you know, good, solid, repeatable, reliable delivery. No, you can't. That's just bullshit. I have been, I, I've, I have been in 25 major companies in the last 15 years, 12 years, something, I don't know, some amount of time. And I have never, ever, ever seen somebody who could come along behind their kind of crappy build, their stupid code that was really never meant to be automated. It was built, meant to be done by a dude that you gave, you know, reams of information about like, oh, here's when you, when you want to build this, here's what you got to do. You got to hold, you, you want to you hold your head in this one, no, no, oh, 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 okay, hold on. You did it all wrong. 
that crazy stuff that people want you to do to get your, to get your code even built, to write the code. It's, it's got to be done. You have to consider the unit test as the base concept. But you also have to think about things like package management. Package managers are another form. Who in here has dropped actual live bits on a Linux box lately? Real, like, like I copied a file. Oh, here's, here's the source. I compiled this, you know, .o or .shared library, and I copied that shared library. Didn't you feel dirty after? Because you should have. Because the, the concept of package management is simply automation for this stupid task that you have to do over and over again that you will, if you had to do that every day, you would fail about 10% of the time. Not because you're stupid or because you're, you know, pathetic at your job. It's because you're human. You're terrible at stuff. I, my, my, my talk last year at OpenSUSE was basically people suck at everything. And they do. I, I actually know a bunch of magicians who have been, very, been pounding this into my head for years now. They're like, I can make you believe anything. I was like, I know. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm a, I actually think I'm a pretty smart guy. Yeah, you got me. I mean, that, that sort of thing. You're just terrible at this repetition behavior. All you're really good at, really, is recognizing kind of patterns and then trying to go back through and iterate over those patterns. That's why nobody ever shows you a magic trick over and over again, because eventually you're going to be like, oh, <laughs> there, that's where you put that? Um, oh, that's gross. But I mean, that, that sort of thing is why, what you're good at. You're good at kind of what, 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 huh, oh, got it. And, and then you move on to the next thing. So click, damn it. Your code is probably not written with automation in mind, because if you're a code guy, you're like, well, that's somebody else's job. They're, and it's the silo, right? So like, here's the, co here's the code guy's silo, or the delimiters. Here's the, that's somebody else's problem, that side, silo. Well, I'll just pass it off to him. You did not write your code to be automated, because you have to do more extra unpleasant work to make code that is good, uh, that is easily automatable. Um, your code was actually probably only written to accomplish what I like to refer to as featureitis which is when a manager comes to you and says, I gotta have this thing in this piece of software right about now. And you go, well, uh, but, you know, here, let me stack it on the giant pile of other crap you've asked me for. And he's like, yeah, it's gotta, this is really important. It's like, different from the really important stuff from last week? Yes, different from that really important stuff. But you know that I'm actually tossing all of my testing out for this. Yeah, we're, we, we, we just accept that as a, as a risk. I, I accept that as a risk. What an asshole. Who says that? You know, it's like it, it, that everybody, we all say that, by the way, <laughs> we're all the assholes, but everybody does that. They all say, I accept the risk. You get in your car, you're accepting a risk. This guy is accepting a risk on your behalf, but you're still going to get blamed for it, right? That's what I call featureitis. It's an inflammation of the feature. And, <laughs> and you're really, the guy is real. His problem is he is definitely not focused on delivery. He's probably not being graded on that. You're not either. If you're a developer, you're probably not being, being graded on delivery, which is, in my opinion, a huge problem. Now, um, this is the place where I live most of the time. I, uh, I, before, I was a Java guy back when Java came out. I, was a, I became a Java developer in the mid-90s. And I was a Java developer until about 2006, when I had that epiphany and I realized what a giant asshole I was. And I went, and the reason that happened, I'll give you the shortest version I can, is I went to this place and I was there for about, I was there for a really long time, for days, and I still couldn't compile the software. There was, it, was a, it was a fairly large, complicated system where we were using a uh, 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 rational application developer to do the build or to, to, to edit the code, really. But when I sat down, I checked this software out of CVS, and I, I went, OK, compile. Everybody, if you're a Java guy, it's basically Eclipse, right? You just compile. Set to compile automatically. Edit the code. Red. And I'm like, OK, well, that's all right. How do I run this? Oh, well, you need to set your system up to run it. How do I do that? Well, you need to talk to one of the guys that's done it. Well, who would that be? Well, just, just go find yourself one. <laughs> OK. 
Hey, how do this? Uh, I don't know. You know, Les went in and did it for me. Go to Les. How do you do this? Well, I actually got him to teach me how to do this. I'm like, well, did he teach you how to do it or did he just do it for it? Well, he just did it for me. Well, where is he? Oh, he's dead. <laughs> hey, he wasn't really dead. He was gone. But I mean, that makes the joke a lot funnier, right? But so there's this guy who knows how to do this. He's not with you anymore. That guy doesn't, he, you no longer know how to handle your problem. You don't understand how to get to a place of success. And so I, I went, oh my God, I'm this guy. I'm the guy who wrote this really crappy piece of software that I can't even get to run. I mean, it really wasn't me, but I mean, I've, obviously I was being, uh, I was being a little, little uh, philosophical there. But I had done it over and over. I had done this to people. I had done this to people. I had written software that works like a champ on my box. What the hell is your problem? So when I did that, I went, I, I, it was, it's, it's, like, um, it's like that picture on the wall that's the, one, the beautiful woman and then the crone. Once you see both things, you can never unsee it ever again. And if you can, if you're in the position right now where you cannot unsee those two things, if you can't unsee those things, you're actually in a very enviable position, in my opinion, for software developers in the world. Because there is a hell of a lot of them sitting about who can still not see it. They still look at it and they go, what's the big deal? It's an operational problem. Operational guys are like, yeah, these guys give me shit all the time. It's like, no, they don't. You just aren't working at it hard enough. You're not working at communicating with them hard enough. No, these guys suck. OK, dude. So having this, this sight in your head, being able to see both the pictures at the same time, made it so that I had to become a, I, mean, I stopped writing software. I haven't written real software in years. I write Maven plugins, and I write puppet manifests, and I write chef's recipes, and I, I write glue that glues tons of stuff together, and I write workflows. But I haven't written a system in a long time because I could not make myself sit down and write software. Like, if, if you gave me an assignment right now, I would spend weeks, probably, writing all the automation around it before I ever wrote a line of code. And I'm not saying that that's what you should do. I'm saying that that's what, how I got to where I am and why we're having this, frankly, uh, sort of meandering conversation. When you get your project, your code was likely built, or the, the build was likely produced by, in, this, like in the case where I had, somebody who's no longer associated with it. So if you have a problem and it's complicated, you're screwed. You have to go become me. And nobody wants to be me. That'd be weird. Um, your build likely hasn't had an overhaul in a long time. This is, this is what I like to refer to. I mean, everybody's know what bit rot is, right? There's no such thing as bit rot. That's bullshit. Code does not stop working over time. The world progresses past it. That's what happens. The code is perfectly fine. At the time when you put it away and it did run, if you went back in time, it would still run back at that point. But that's not where you are now. So you haven't had an overhaul probably in a really long time on your build the way you haven't had an overhaul in practically anything because you're a software guy and you're moving forward all the time. And that's good. It really is, but it really kind of, it, it really does, it takes a really long time to do these things. And when you get to the point where you have this, um, where you have done this, this massive beatdown on your build, and you get finished, let's say you're like, okay, we're overhauling the build, we're gonna, this is a 3,000 line ant build, and we're gonna switch it to a 2,000 line maven palm, <laughs> then, I mean, you, 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 you puked out a thousand lines of code, which is really good, but you get to the end and you might as well start again because time has passed, things have shifted, the world has progressed forward. Maybe it hasn't gone far enough to really screw you over, but it probably did. And when you have this build, you get to this very, this kind of rebuilt thing and it really doesn't do everything you need to do in the first place. You are, does anybody here do, is a Java guys in here, anybody Java people? Like, oh, well, all four of you, wow. Usually there's more. So are you Maven people, Gradle people, whatever? Do you do the Maven release plugin to do your releases on your software? Yes. Do you? Yes. Damn right you do. Because if you're going to use a tool like Maven, you should at least you know, wring every bit of you can out of it. But it's a giant pain in the ass. Setting up these pieces to do all this stuff is a giant pain in the ass. Nobody wants to do that. And yet, if you don't, your life is going to suck somewhere down the road. You're going to have to do this overhaul. You're going to have to go through this process, and you're not going to be able to deliver very well. 
Oh, <laughs> I forgot this part. Um, does everybody know what I mean by that? Yep, of course you do. Magic build machine. Oh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Liars. So when I got to this magic place where I had my epiphany, they had a machine you could build the software on. It just wasn't yours. And I'm like, well, is it, can I do like a P to V to P <laughs> on this and actually get this machine on my box? And they're like, I don't even know what that means. And I'm like, I'm not even sure it's going to work. And there is a machine somewhere where the build will actually work, but it won't work when you're like, if you're the guy who's, re if you're the release manager and you're like in charge of doing it, hell no. You know, check out the code, do the build, do the release process, doesn't work. Well, it works on the build machine. Hey, asshole, this is the build machine. That's just some machine that you guys futz around with to make it things happen. That's really my favorite part, by the way, of builds. The magic build machine is, is possibly one of the things I, I have to admit something, I actually physically assaulted somebody for that one time. <laughs> Many years ago, like more than five years ago. I, uh, I got, I have a bit of an anger management problem. And uh, so the guys, he goes, well, just make your machine look like this. Uh, and it's a Windows box. I mean, like, you know, you, how do you make a Windows box look like another Windows box? Copy. <laughs> just, just clone it and see if you can make it happen, right? Well. It, couldn't, it didn't happen, and finally I'm like, look, it's not working. He goes, well, it's not my problem, and I'm like, it's about to become your problem. And he goes, what are you going to do, whip my ass? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> he goes, no, you're not. And I'm like, dude, I have literally beaten up hundreds of people across my life. I used to be a bouncer. And you're just another one to me. I mean, like, I, won't, I, won't, I, won't, I, will, I will not lose a moment's sleep on this. And the guy was like, he goes, well, what are you going to do? And I said, first I'm going to slap you in the head. And he goes, what? I went like this. And he's like, you're not kidding, are you? And I said, yes, I'm dead serious. I, in the end, you're going to be bleeding, and I'm still not going to have what I want. Why don't you just give me what I want, and let's skip all the blood? I wish that was the only instance of that I could have say that in my life. Like I, say, I, have, I have like literally dozens of those stories where I'm incapable of controlling my behavior. And uh. All right, back to the story. Releasing. You suck at releasing. You do. Because good delivery depends on release management. Ra managing the process of release is really essential to this. It's actually process management. There's, you, you, you probably, you don't use the Maven release plugin. You don't, do you? Not ever. Yeah, okay. Sometimes. If you get it sometimes, hell, that's better than almost everybody I've ever been to. They, I, get, I get hired with some frequency to fix the Maven problem. Like, we have a Maven problem. I'm like, no, you have a developer problem. But anyway, let's fix that. And you get to the end, and you're like, well, like, well, so I, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of vomit that I had in the past. They're like, oh, well, we have a Maven repository, but we check it all into Subversion. Now, for people who are Maven people, who have ever used Maven, you, if, you, that probably, if you go, how the hell did you do that? I'm like, yeah, that's exactly the problem. They are tracking, basically, the back end of a system using what amounts to a database. And that is a really terrible idea with Maven because Maven is designed to be repeatable under a variety of circumstances. And so when you do it that way, when you do it the stupid way, it takes away from the whole, the value that you're getting for anything. And it doesn't matter whether it's Maven or, you know, if you're doing Builder or whatever, whatever tool you're using, all your software basically has tons of dependencies that deal with it and that's what Maven fixes. A problem that Maven started fixing was dependency management in Java, and it was a huge problem, and they really still haven't gotten it right. But you have to have the, you have to have the ability to use the tool correctly, and if you don't, you actually give yourself more trouble than less. Once again, this is why people, they hire me in. They're like, I've got to fix this Maven problem. I'm like, let me say, oh my god, <laughs> you're like the third people I've seen like this in six months. And they're like, really? Yeah, like this is a, you know, this, the thing where I said the checking all the Maven repository into a subversion thing, that's, like a, that's a thing people do. Apparently it's a thing lots of people do, because hell, I've seen, I saw it three times in six months, and I'm pretty sure I didn't live in the weirdo world where no, all the people who did that are. So I, the, you, have to have, you have to have a focus on the process of delivery and an understanding of the process as it applies to the tool. Because if you don't, dude, Seriously, 
And that's by, that's, but by the way, you probably don't release code, and that's as defined by me, because I have a very strict definition of what that means, but that's really what that meant. Sorry, I, I went off on a little rant there. Um, your, your release process almost certainly does not document results of what happened. Like, what is this release, really? I mean, and by, by me, or for a release, it has, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about this later, but it's a very specific point in time, and it means very specific things to me. You're like, oh, well, we released the software today. I'm like, well, which features did you release? And they're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> then you really didn't fucking do it as far as I'm concerned. Um, you probably have to hand manage your releases. There's probably not some sort of robot monkey in the background going, <laughs> push, button, push, button, push the button, and release Paul's out. And you get values, you get documentation, you get versioning, you get management of all this stuff. Probably not. Almost certainly not. Because if you did, then I would have probably heard about more instances where that actually happened. Now, Let's think about this for a minute. There's tons of software, and, and I'm a Fedora guy, I'm a Red Hat guy. But in the repositories for Fedora, there are, well, I mean, there are thousands of packages. So this shit has to work somewhere, right? Right? I mean, that, that's, it, it seems reasonable to say that. And I have fallen through the, re, the, the release processes for some of these packages. I have actually done it myself, worked with people who did it, and they don't suck at this game. And then there's the other 99% of people who, once again, do get paid to do this. And they, they're, the drivers for people who do open source software are just radically different. When I come to these things and I, later on somebody will come up to me and they're like, yeah, I don't really have this. You know, we, we release software all, you know, all the time. And I'm like, okay, who do you work for? And they're like, well, you know, I work with the blank project. And I went, oh. Well, okay, what do you do for money? And they're like, oh, I work for, some .NET shop. I'm like, well, can't you just take the things you learn there and apply them over here? And they're like, yeah, it's really hard. I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> it's really easy to stand up here and bitch about it, though, I can tell you that. So this is the part people forget. Configuration. In, a, in, a Linux, the, in the Linux world, in the, in the Unix world, we externalized configuration from the beginning, more or less. We had Etsy, and it was, and it was awesome. And Etsy was where all our configurations lived way back in the bad old days. And you had a file, and we liked it. It sucked. You had to edit that bitch with Emacs or VI or whatever you use, and you're like, well, I don't even know how to configure this thing. I'm like, well, you had to go read the manual and learn how to do it. Well, good, because that configuration file was a hell of a lot better than the database dump that you have to do in order to do it in half the applications I use now. There's a tool. I'm going to, this is going to go on the internet, right? Okay, I'm not going to say that tool. But there's a tool that I use a lot that has a database behind it. And once you've installed and started using this tool, that's it, dog. No more. You can't even unload the database and move it to another place and have two of them. It just doesn't work. So having, this, having your data, your externalized configuration be easily accessible and manageable and source code controllable means what I say when I say externalized configuration makes or breaks deliveries. If I, can do a, if I can do a configuration that's the config for test and the configuration for prod, I can have a dev configuration, a test configuration, a prod configuration, and it's a really easy thing to do, you might actually do it. If it's hard, if you have to go build a database and run a dump a bunch of crap into that database and edit the stuff in the database by hand, which I did last week again, then that, nobody does that. You're like, screw this, dude. I'll just go work against prod. I'll, I'll, run, I'll run my tests against the prod code. How about that, bitch? That's what you got. And people do. I do. I did. <laughs> Still do. Um, almost always your code is configured internally. You've got some baked in crap in the inside. You have a, you, my favorite so far is the database server I, uh, URL that's baked into a couple of systems that I had to work with. Sometimes it's not configured at all. Sometimes you literally cannot change the configuration even by rebuilding the software. If you do this, you're kind of a jerk. Because when you do that, what that means is, I did it right the first time, and screw you hippies. And I don't think that you probably did. <laughs> Your software probably isn't necessarily built for my environment. And I I'm almost certainly have a database server that's not called Felix. Almost certainly. And when you have configurations that are difficult to manage and harder to source, co source control, then this problem sort of starts creeping along. It gets, it just continues to get worse. 
And having these, having these problems means that you are generally living with a, with a piece of software that is configuration, that it is surrounded by moats of alligators. Effectively, it is impossible to breach the configuration. It is surrounded by alligators or flaming oil. It's a possibility. There's a flaming oil. Or there is oily flaming alligators, depending on how you're going to do that. But there's always this, this hurdle you have to cross to deal with that. You, OK, how do you configure NTP? Anybody? In the NTP daemon, sorry. NTP.conf. Is there another way to configure NTP? Yeah. But is there another way, really a different way to configure NTP? <laughs> right. Sure. In the Unix world, there's really more or less one way. You edit some config file and you do the thing and it gives you this config file and it works. Now, in the Microsoft world, it's radically different. But in real software, then it's, it, it is, uh, it's, done with, it's done with a file, right? That is, I, I, I feel so old when I say that, but it's like, man, that's, that was, they just got it right the first time. It's not XML. It's not YAML. It's not, God, I hate YAML. It's not some weird, I, okay, I, YAML beats the hell out of, and, and Richard is not in here, thank God. The, but it beats the hell out of having an SQLite database that holds all my configuration in it. It does, I'm sorry. I don't want to drive a database to, to change a URL for, my, for your application. I just don't. Um, so, you're not delivering. It's, you, what you want to do is you want to drop the pizza off in 30 minutes like the thing goes, right? But you probably don't have somebody who's more or less in charge of that. If you do, they're probably not very good at their job. I know because I train these people pretty regularly. And in my opinion, the people that I work with who are called release managers are really non-technical. Effectively speaking, they are non-technical. They are much more suited for the food services or janitorial industries, in my opinion, than they are for release management. And that is, not a, that, is, that is not a degradation to those things, but it is a different world to live in. These are people who, in my opinion, should have stuck with middle management or whatever other useless crap they do and not gotten in the way of the developers and the operations people. Um, they frequently don't deliver on time. You probably don't deliver. If you write software, who in here made their last deadline and nailed that shit? Really? Yeah, I'm good. So more than zero people. I sure didn't, because I was, I, was I was like, did I? No, no, I didn't, actually. <laughs> but awesome. So one out of hmm, 35, that's probably about right. Like 5%, I would say, is about what I've seen. And working in large, uh, large uh, enterprises, that's less than that most of the time. Now, it's usually they get to it, but yeah, it was meant to be Thursday. Turns out it's Saturday. So. I really hate this whole clicking the mouse thing, by the way. Excuse me, clicking the trackpad. Um, it, you have a difficult time expressing what was delivered. Which features got delivered? Well, we delivered these features. Really? Did you roadmap those? Do you have those tied all the way back to source code control, to the build? Did you manage to make all that happen? Yeah, that list is actually not exactly complete. We have a couple of features that made it into the end. How did that happen? Well, you know, we didn't edit the file before we delivered it to you. Well, why would you have to edit the file to deliver to him? Why, don't, why, don't your, why doesn't your bill just harvest this information from the canonical source of information about this, which would be the source code control system and my issue tracker, and puke that out as part of the bill? Well, because that's hard to set up. No, it's really not that hard to set up. But you do have to do it, and you have to, you have to babysit it a little bit. Yeah, it doesn't all, it's true, it doesn't always work. But that's usually because some jackass decided not to actually update an issue, too. I, it, it has failed on me several times. I, I fully admit that everything I'm telling you about, all the stuff I'm complaining about, has some fragility to it. It's software. There's, I mean, there, we get sunspots. I actually had a machine go down during one of the, the corona things that happened last year. Yeah. That was awesome. I'm like, I actually had something die during the sunspot. I'm like, I, I did it. Shit happens, man. <laughs> but, but um, that was that was like a that was like a, a, a pinnacle moment for me too, because I had been bitching about sunspot activity for decades, and then it was like, <laughs> it really happens. I didn't really believe that. <laughs> like it was like a third of a data center too, not like one machine. But 
The one thing you're probably not doing is you're probably not delivering immutable artifacts. If you're not working for something that dumps into one of the, the RPM databases or the, the Debian databases for Ubuntu or something like that, you're probably not delivering truly immutable stuff. You probably don't bake something, tag it, build it, take the result, hand it to a good and say, this is it. And he goes, well, what if I have to change it? And you go, well, here's your configuration information. Change these files and read, read it all. It'll read these config files and you do it. He goes, oh, no, this is not working. You're like, oh, hold on, I gotta go, cop I gotta go fix the code. If you ever have to go back to the code to configure something, you don't really have something that's truly immutable. You have a, you have a mostly immutable. And immutable is a real, is what, is what it is, what, absolutes, <laughs> it's an absolute. It's either immutable or it's mutable. Um, you probably don't keep the results of this in some kind of reasonable uh, repository. If, you're a, if you build RPMs, you sure as hell do though, or you probably do. Um, this has actually gotten a lot better for a whole bunch of people in the last four or five years, but still not the best thing in the whole world. When I, when I, when I walk into a, because what, what does the world run on again? What is the software that the world runs on? Correct, correct answer to that is, it's, it's a, it's a uh, trick question. The correct answer is COBOL, but I'm looking for Java. And when you, when you, get, into, uh, when you get into a place that's a Java, that's a Java shop, frequently there's, there is one tool, there's effectively one tool you should be using to make that work. It's called Nexus. The repository for Java software is Nexus. There's these other ones, there's Archiva and, and Artifactory, and they're just fine. The correct answer is Nexus. And it's not because Nexus is good or because I happen to be friends with the guy that wrote it but because it just works better than the other ones do. And when you, if you don't put your stuff in at least one of these things and build out of it and stop changing stuff, then you're really not dealing with immutability and you're not storing your stuff in a way that other people can get to it. Yeah, so once again, this is the horse I love to kick. Your stuff probably isn't recognizably versioned. Okay, so if you were here last year, you heard me scream about this over and over again, you're welcome to ignore this whole thing. There is exactly one way to version software that is correct. All other ways are wrong. Semantic versioning is the correct mechanism for versioning your software, and every other way is wrong. It is, it is mathematically wrong. I can actually prove to you why it's wrong. I'm not even good at math and I can prove to you why it's wrong. What's the date format? What is a date? Date format. What's the correct date format? Uh, Wrong. What is the correct date format? Oh, damn it, you people suck. Why, why, why is this answer right? Year, 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 year. Month, month. Day, day. Hour, hour. Second, second. Micro, micro, micro. Time zone. Why is that correct? Because it's a fucking standard. Because you, well, that's one. <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a, the right answer. But it's because it's a standard. It's not because it's the right answer. It's because people have accepted this as the right answer. Semantic versioning is not right because it's right. It's right because people look at it and they go, oh, that totally makes sense. And if you saw my thing from last year where I put all the really bad examples of people's versions up, I, I have found some new ones and I just stopped updating that slide. It is so painful to watch some of the dumb crap that people put in the middle of a version. Why do you put that there? Oh, well, later I want to be able to understand where it came from. I need to know which revision that came from. Well, you don't. That should be baked into that build. Well, it's not, so I have to figure it out. You don't have a tag in your source code control system that points to that, that thing? Well, no. Well, you're an asshole then. <laughs> because there's, there are already tools for this. Yes, and if I just called you an asshole, once again, bring it on. <laughs> I get it. Not everybody agrees with me about semantic versioning the way that not everybody agrees with me about the date format. But the truth is, is that more people start to agree with me about semantic versioning, and there's a freaking ISO standard for the date. So I'm pretty sure I got it. What's that? One one. Well, there's, there's, the one, there's the one, though. There's 80. 596. I, I, I ought to know the answer to this. But. So you're going to tell, you're going to walk off onto this calendar thing for me, right? You're going to give me the, you're going to give me the, the Gregorian calendar issue or the. Yeah. Why? Because we're assholes. But. 
Yeah. Right. Well, it's actually a standard. It's an ISO standard, so it's actually an international standard at this point. Yeah, but you're going a little bit the ISO standards for all the dates. I mean, France is all. Yeah, yeah, it's true. That's, you're absolutely right about this. And when you put that, when you print that out, and you, what, who was it said this just a minute ago? Why is it, why is it better? Because it's sortable. Having the data be consistent across the world, I, I am the first to admit, I am, I'm the first to admit that I will typically be an ugly American about a lot of things. But this is actually one of the ones we got right. We don't do that a lot. We fuck up a lot of stuff in this country, especially in other countries. This is one of the ones we got right. I'll, I'm holding on to this one. You, I get it. Other people have their standards, and I'm totally, I'm behind you. You can sit over there and be the way that you are all the time, and I, and I fully support your idea, your, the idea that these exist. But there is a real good reason why this particular one is better. And what? ISO dates weren't meant to be display dates. They're not meant to. They're meant to be interrupted. Exactly. And when you, t when I, when you show an ISO date. When you give it to somebody, well, if you don't localize that date, what are you? <laughs> yeah, if you're in France and I have a date that I've stored and you show me that date in some, in some American format, you're an asshole. You just are. Because these people have all, you, you and you and you, everybody, we've all come up with the way that we, we see these things. That's why we have localization. But when you put that bitch into a piece of software and it has to be read, it needs, to be a read, it needs to be read in one way, because the one way is the right way. Now, beyond all that, why am I so pissed about this? Well, I'm a consultant. I, I make a fairly good living uh, being angry about these problems. And because they exist, you would think, dude, what are you like bitching because you have work? Well, yeah, I am actually. I work in DevOps. That's what I do. I train people to talk to each other. That's really what I do. That's my whole job in life, is to train people to talk to each other. I know that probably seems weird when you consider how sort of angry talky I am, but I'm actually pretty good at that part of it. Um, for whatever reason, people like me. I don't like them back, but they like me. And I see a bunch of broken shit every day. I see, I walk in, I'm like, you want to do continuous delivery? I mean, because you heard that it's awesome. Okay. Well, why don't we have a way to build your code first? Why don't we start with like the genetic level problems and work our way up? Let's let's don't overstretch. Let's let's try to work our way up to that. And so when you get there, they pay us a lot of money, but then nobody really wants it fixed. Because it's too much work. Oh, I don't want to fix this. Uh, they don't let us get to the problem and succeed. Or more specifically, they don't let me succeed the way that my anal retentive ass wants to succeed. I, am ex I, I have a view of the way things ought to be. And if it's not there, it's just wrong. And I get it. I've walked away from jobs. I've walked away from every job I've ever been in with looking back and going, well, that's wrong. I've never fully succeeded. But that's just a, that's a personal failing on my part, not because the thing didn't work. So an environment is a specifically configured platform. It is a, an environment can be a variety of things. A num, like a, it's, a, it's a CentOS 6.3 box with a particular MySQL database installed on it. The way you build an environment is through some automation. That's just all there is to it. All other ways suck. Now, when you say, okay, well, I have an AMI that I crank up on EC2, well, okay, how'd you get that AMI again? How'd you get it from somebody? Well, how'd they get it? Well, they, they just pulled it out of their ass. Well, why don't you start with something that you understand, layer the correct things on it automatically, and then know how to change it later. This is a, this is, I hate to have to walk through this, but I walk through it with every one of our customers. What is a release? It is the, um, the process of producing an immutable artifact. It is a, by God, this is where it is in time. In Git terms, it's a, it's a SHA-1 of a tree-ish. It's some place in the software that we have said is it's a tag, frequently. It's a thing that produces the thing that we are going to use. And it should be managed as an independent versioned entity. Like you should really 
think about it, once you've detached it from source code control, you really can think about it as a completely different thing now. You might have to walk back over to the, to the uh, pig pen to get into it again. But once you've got a release, you should be able to handle that. That's what it, that should do the work. We've already talked about version. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't even matter if you use semantic version, although if you don't, you're wrong. The, it needs to be semantically notable. You need to be, I need to be able to compare the things. I need to be able to know that this version is more than this version, that this version is compatible with this other version. That's what semantic version gives you, by the way. It's not really about the number. It's about compatibility. It's about API compatibility, which I will bitch about tomorrow. Um, a deployment is when you take a release and you make it accessible into an environment. See how I put all those together? And it's inserting a version of a generally released artifact into an environment. When you've done that, you've made a delivery. But remember how I said you're not really delivering? If you did it and, it su and you suffered through the process, yeah, you didn't need to do that. It doesn't have to be hard. Um, it doesn't need to be as hard as it is. And the reason that it is not, damn it, it is not easy is that we have, this, we have this view of zones of control in software. That's not my problem. And we, you might refer to those as silos where you come from. But in what, what I do, what the thing that I'm allegedly supposed to be doing when I go to my clients is kind of bridging those zones of control. And in a communication is supposed to improve. And automation should go up, not down. And human-introduced failure should go down. But it doesn't. Uh, you might say that I'm not good at what I do at that point, right? I, I, you, you would not be completely wrong. But frequently it actually goes down before it goes up again because people get really freaked out about this. Operation people in the room, have you ever wondered whether your job would be automated away from you? Of course you have. I mean, I, I do primarily operations now. I don't really do a whole bunch of code monkey stuff. And I have frequently looked at this and said, if this is what I did for a living, really, I just replaced my shelf with a shelf script. Not really, but I mean, I'm, obviously I'm being, I'm being uh, expansive there. But, the, but yeah, I, I just took away, I, I actually try to take away operations people's positions. I don't want you to not have a job. I want you to do a better job. I want you to do something cooler than what you do. If you had to shell into that box to make that happen, hmm, well, we can fix that. So. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody really wants to lose their job. I don't want you to lose your job. I want you to be, I want you to be more awesomer than what you were before. DevOps addressable issues arise from a whole bunch of different stupid things. And they don't, people don't really want them solved. They, they really don't. Well, you want them solved, and you want them solved, and I want them solved. But there's these people that float above us that don't really want them solved. They really don't. Because they don't, they think of you, uh, operations guy, Developer guy, operations guy, developer guy, pick me two. Who's a, who's a developer? You two. You are the same person to, that per, to those people. You are, you are, you're just a different flavor of freak on a leash. You're this nerd that they lock up in the, some room with great air conditioning, or you're this guy that they shove into some cube farm with all of his other nerdy little friends, and they talk about it, and they laugh at you behind your back. They do. I know, because I'm in some of those meetings where they talk about how nerdy we are. I'm like, Bitch, I'm right here. I'm sitting right here. And they're like, yeah, but they're all nerdy. I'm like, you have no idea how big my comic book collection is. <laughs> and so when you, when, you, when you get involved in, when you're in software, when you're in the guts and blood of software, they think of you like you're the same. And so they don't give a shit if your, your problems get solved. Is anybody in here mid-level management? <laughs> I didn't think you'd thrown up to that, would you? Of course you won't. That's like calling yourself a project manager. Um, they don't want all the problems. They don't want your problem solved. They just want their problem solved, which is, I want th this. You have to put this feature into production at this time, and blah, blah, blah. And they don't give a shit how you do it. And when people don't care how you do something, you frequently don't care how you do something. And that's, that tends to be a problem. They, the, the idea of, of communicating with other people as a mechanism for addressing the inequity between the two kinds of weirdos that we all are, because we're all both kinds, honestly, the, the, two, the two factions of software, addressing that, in, that inequity 
communicating with your people can actually stop that problem. But the problem with that is, is that people don't communicate. They, in, a, in, a, in an environment, if you two worked in the same place, you would probably actively dislike each other most of the time. Ops guy, you know, con, you know software guy, ops guy, software guy. You even have labels for it so that you can know that you're not all software people. Developer, operations guy. Okay. And so when we talk about what we do, what I do in DevOps, does it really work? Like, does, does this whole idea of making communication happen work? Well, you know, I would say this, sort of. It sort of works. I would love to sit up here and tell you that what I do is amazingly successful and that I, I walk in and people walk out and they're like, man, I wish I could be him. They don't do that. They come in. Then I, when I leave a space, they go, well, at least he is gone. A lot of times they say, at least he's gone. Now we can get back to the, to the, to the you know, work business of hating each other again. That frequently happens, but it doesn't have to. It, you shouldn't have to consider it as something special at all. This communication between the, between the bridging of the things, should just, that should just be the way it is. You should just be able to look at somebody and say, hey, I have this software and you're now responsible for deploying it, and they should not look at you like you just handed them a steaming pile of poo. And if you've been in operations and you've received a piece of software to deployment, you've almost certainly gone, okay. Smells like poo. You almost certainly have. I know, because I'm, you know. The problem is, is that that's not the way things are. It isn't how things work. That's why they drag my company. I, I work for a reasonably large DevOps consultancy, whose name I'm not allowed to mention because I'm not allowed to, because uh, I say a bunch of bad words in my, in my presentations. And so, but we have, we have companies all over the place that drag us into this stuff. And we go in and we're like, yeah, automate, yeah, communicate, yeah, automate. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we leave. And they just And it's not because what we did was bad. It's because they, were, they, they only did it when they were made to do it. So here's what I think about this. I think that there's no such thing as a DevOps guy. I think there's no such thing as a DevOps mind frame. I think there's actually two. I think there's the communication part and the automation part. I think there's actually two completely different things about this. And I think that very few people are good at both of those things. I'm actually really good at automation. I can make weird shit happen with tools that you have probably heard of and you could probably do exactly the same thing, but I've just been doing it for a long time. And that's the only reason I'm any good at it. But I can automate the shit out of stuff. And I can stand up here in front, in front of you and say a bunch of embarrassing things about myself and be kind of rude and everything. And I can also communicate with you. I can even make you communicate with each other while I'm there. But I can make a lot of people do a lot of things while I'm there. I mean, sometimes even under threat of damage, you know, that sort of stuff. But I can make it happen because people, when I, when I say, here's what you should do, they're like, OK. And they'll start doing it. And you're like, yeah, go, go. And then all of a sudden, I'm like a, I'm like a tennis judge, right? Yeah, yeah. And I turn away, and they're like, throw the racket. Because this is just how people are. I'm less good at the communication establishment pieces than I am at the automation parts. I think automation experts are uh, incredibly useful to DevOps, and I think communications people are. But I think there's actually the, pro the there's, well, OK, I'm going to skip this part. This is the part where I bitch about people trying to hire DevOps engineers, because I'm running out of time. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm long-winded. This is where I bitch about them. The, the truth is, is you just read this slide. It should not, you should not hire DevOps engineers. You should not try to build DevOps engineers. You should try to teach your goddamn management how to listen. That's what you should do. If you can get your management to start listening, everything becomes a lot easier. Now, you could also write me a big fat check. Um, but the management, they're, they're managers. They're smarter than you. If you were smart as they are, they'd be, you'd be a manager. So there's really, it's a, it's a, that's a tough road to hoe. But it is sort of the deal. Now, of course they're smarter than you. Because that's why things are so awesome and why you have smart management. And because of this, all of the stuff that I've said is completely wrong. Every, all the bad stuff I've talked about doesn't really even exist. Because management's so smart, right? They've got, they've got this shit under control. Well, no, they don't. And that's the segue. So seriously, no more segue. Um, it is possible that some ops and uh, people, you have to accept the idea that it might not work. 
You have to accept the idea that it might not work, but we know people can, that there can. And maybe that what there is is there's this value system you need to install instill into people. And these alleged values may help you with some of your fails. So the points you're failing at and the solutions to those, and then going back to talking about that, we're not going to. The first one, the big one, is drive. You have to want it. You don't like your job enough if you don't want it to change to be better. And you have that be the change you want to see in the world, whatever bullshit that means. Yeah, sure, you do. You have to want to change. And you have to be willing to sacrifice occasionally the chicken. But more importantly, you might have to willi be willing to sacrifice somebody else's ego, maybe yours. Now, somebody's ego generally has to die when you get to this, when, you, when you've actually enacted any of this. And you have to be willing to be unpopular. I am very willing to be unpopular. You have to be able to focus, especially on the process. Um, good software is often all, almost always written in a meticulous fashion. It's almost always done with solid process. And it almost always has a, a process that accompanies it. Most processes were most good processes were done designed, not grown, back to the farmer problem. Um, you have to be able to measure what it is that you are trying to improve on. This is an agile thing in the world, and you just have to be able to do it. Sometimes you have to be willing to take less velocity to get more measure. And you need to be able to take those metrics and make them into something useful. Anybody work for an ISO 9000 company? Yeah, that's the whole deal, right? You, you ISO 9000, you collect metrics, and then you go back and you change how stupid you were for doing it. Never happens. Um, this is the last piece. Seriously, I promise. You have to be able to, you, you fa everybody fails at recognizing the tiny little pieces that are the cumulative parts of the, of the pain. The pain is all about the small fail. It's the, I left this piece of software unformatted. I, le I, I don't want to switch from my shitty software to, uh, source code control system to something good. It, the way you fix this is you do stuff. You automate a repetitive task. You reformat your code. Only do that once, by the way. Don't continuously reformat your code. That's weird. Um, you adopt some intelligent uh, versioning system. You clean up one of your stupid APIs. Your APIs are probably stupid. You should clean them up. And you fix one thing every day, and you leave it. It's like, it's like they taught you in kindergarten. Leave the room a little cleaner than you, left, than you found it. Now, um, <laughs> this is back to that whole part of the people. You just got to teach people how to listen. And, and, and the truth is, is you probably don't have enough power to make that happen. But this is back to that piece. Any questions? Good. So thank you. Um, I will be anywhere you want me to be if you want to talk about and you want to bitch about how these things are. And I will, uh, I'll be happy to listen to your bitching about it. And I'll be happy to listen to you bitching about me. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs> By the way, it always looks like that when I talk. So. If you, um, if you decide to come to, another, to my thing tomorrow, I'll just be bitching about a very narrow part of what I just complained about. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.